Hello, this is revamped, reinvigorated, rebooted truths. One of the things we told you we were going to bring you was the truth behind all reality, a bold claim, some have said. But this is a spiritual truths where we're going to explore spiritual realities together through literature, thinking, and just me saying stuff. Soft Life says, more spiritual truth, please. A lot of people say to me, Russell, how do you maintain this spirituality? And I say, you also don't know me, because <laughs> most of the time I'm so furious, I'm just stepping back from killing someone. Like the reason, you know, like sometimes when I'm on telly and it's like snide gate or me touching that geezer's leg or whatever, that's because like, it, for me, it's so close to the surface. I'm so malleable. It'll be so easy to make me go nuts on telly. That's why I would never do a reality TV show because you'd be on the first half hour. Okay, so we follow Russell Brand as he goes through the trials and tribulations as his life as a comedian come political activist. Day one, Russell has some porridge. It's fucking cold! <laughs> He's picked up to go to a 12-step fellowship meeting. Where's my fucking car? Look, is it going to be quicker to get a car? Or should I just get a fucking chair? <laughs> Russell comes out of a 12-step meeting. That fucking drunk motherfucker! <laughs> So for me, I heard once someone say that only the real sick people become Trappist monks. I'm at such a, the reason like, that I'm so focused on spirituality is because I have to be. I'm a lunatic, but I know that the thing I have to deal with is within me. I know that the only way to change the outside world is by changing the self. Not least because you change your perception, but also I think on a fundamental level, if you change the energy frequencies in your own consciousness, the external frequencies that are interconnected with that and interrelated to that constantly, you also change and also alter. Ah! This is a book by a man called David Hawkins. If you've heard of him at all, it'll be because he invented this thing called, I don't know, kinesiology or whatever. You know that thing where they go, are you allergic to oranges? And they push your arm down. Now hold somebody you love and hold your arm and hold them up. Okay, hold somebody uh, you don't like in mind. You got somebody you don't like? Somebody you're scared of? Okay, resist. In this, he talks really interestingly about the fundamental nature of uh, happiness and the, our relationship between the inner world and the external world and how they're intertwined. To learn more about this, look at biocentrism, or perhaps bizarrely, look at the rubber bandits who seem to be highly advanced scientists as far as I can work out. So this is from David Hawkins' book called uh, Letting Go, where he talks about the principle of surrendering things is uh, the only way to find peace. So he says, now we're going to focus more on inner emotional life because that's where we actually really live. The purpose of health and wealth is, after all, merely because we presume, and to some extent it's true, that they result in happiness, health and wealth, fair enough. Happiness can be experienced directly, however, and on this level it is relatively independent of health or wealth. Let's take an objective look at the average view of happiness. To begin with, the happiness is extremely vulnerable. A chance remark, a critical comment, a raised eyebrow, or a car cutting into line ahead of us are all sufficient to blow the average person's happiness in an instant. Yeah, my personal serenity can be knocked off track if someone says anything. What kind of happiness and serenity do we have if it's so easily interrupted? What we're trying to cultivate within ourselves is an inner peace and tranquility that can to some degree be detached from the external the world. Someone says you're an idiot, you're like, oh, that's that person just expressing their own views. Someone says you're amazing and they want to have sex with you, oh, that person has their own needs and stuff. You don't form an excessive attachment to the outside world. You, to a degree, have such a strong relationship with your inner life, with the infinite consciousness within you, the consciousness that I would argue, and I'm arguing now, is connected to all phenomena. The external stimuli are not what governs you. The realm of the senses, the mechanical body and the mechanical world, these are the necessities for our survival but our inner life the consciousness behind all of our basic emotions our basic fears our basic impulses jealousy greed selfishness love desire all these stimulants we have to learn to associate with the consciousness behind all of it the stronger our connection to that becomes the greater chance of inner revolution and therefore outer the threat of a job loss, another thing that could mess you up, a feeling of distrust in a relationship, a foreboding remark by a doctor, especially if you weren't even at the doctor's. You there, I don't like the look of that mole. What, what, what was that? An impertinent cab driver is sufficient to ruin the day for many of us. Why is our happiness so fragile that commonplace occurrences can ruin the whole day? Why is that? In the section on the anatomy of emotions, we've already looked at the reasons for this. As a result of negative feelings, thoughts and attitudes, together with the constant judgment and criticism of other people, we often feel separated from others. Because of this feeling of inner aloneness and separation, relationships take on the form of attachments with all the fear, 
anger and jealousy that accompany any threat to those attachments. The inner negativity results in such commonly held belief as you are born alone and you die alone. Nothing is in fact farther from the truth. As recent books on near-death experiences reveal, it's during life that one often feels alone and at the moment of death there is an absolute feeling of oneness and connectedness. Because of attachments, dependencies and inner smallness, we may feel weak and limited. The guilty intolerance of our inner thoughts and feelings are projected onto the world, making the world look like a fearful place. Because these fears are held in mind, fearful events and experiences are literally brought into our experience. Fear results in chronic anger and makes us prone to attack and to inner emotional chaos. Pain and suffering occur with periodic despair and proneness to emotional upset. The ego mind, which sees everyone as separate, is envious of anyone else who appears happier, more successful, or has a better relationship, a better body, or better connections. Soon, because of a lack of inner clarity about goals, there is confusion leading to self-pity, envy, and further resentment. Self-condemnation gets endlessly projected onto the world, taking the form of condemnation from others, which increases further the guilt and feeling of smallness. So. What I suppose books like uh, Letting Go by David, Haw David Hawkins deal with is our perception of the world, our experience of the world, is governed by inner phenomena. As children we pick up certain traits, patterns, habits, we're in fact inadvertently trained by our own muddled parents to see the world a certain way, to develop certain erroneous and sometimes unhealthy, often unhealthy, requirements from other people. As the spiritual journey, I suppose, for me, is to rediscover the truth of who you actually are, to let go of attachments to, first in my case, drugs and alcohol, that latterly to sex or pornography or caring what other people feel about you or money or status. None of these things can provide you with permanent happiness. All of these things are distractions. We're here on this planet for a temporary time. We should be spending our time, some of our time pursuing leisure and joy, all of our time in a spirit of love. We've ended up somehow on this mad planet where we work all the time, most of us doing jobs that we absolutely deplore, getting up to trudge through some sort of meaningless ritual that doesn't relate to the survival of the planet, that doesn't benefit our community. When people talk about an illusion, they mean this. If you're a person that's working in a job in the city that's entirely abstract, or a person that's working in a fast food chain selling food that's not providing any nourishment, or me working at the MTV Awards, beaming low consciousness activity a uh, population, keeping them spellbound, distracted and feeling inferior, you're participating in meaninglessness. The only thing that's real is we are these mechanical beings made of flesh, on this, on this planet temporarily that all seem to be having some experience of consciousness. All of the great saints and sages, whether it's Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of them say that within yourself there is infinite connectivity, internet connect, infinite connection, and internet connection now, thank God, thank Muhammad, like, and, that until we learn to serve that above all else, until, until we learn the service of other people will always bring more happiness than the service of ourselves, we're trapped in a kind of illusory prison. So I suppose, what, what should we do? Well, I don't know, do what you want, we're all on this journey together, let's learn more, let's read more, let's watch the truths more, let's create alternative systems. Spend some time every day alone with who you are. See what feelings come up when you do that. See what it is you're running from. See what it is you're trying to hide from because you'll find that there's nothing in there actually but infinite love but you do have to get through hell to get there. That's some true news. <laughs>